Hi, and welcome to another Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I talked to a musician who I actually had spoken with before on a different podcast that I did for my band. And uh, this person creates videos, music, covers, originals, and does it all through YouTube and has created a following, has made a life of being a musician. It's it's great stuff, puts out great videos, and their covers, the covers range from songs to movie soundtracks to video game soundtracks. Those are the type of covers that they create ever since we met the first time, just been following what they do and been so interested in it and wanted to have them back on to talk about how they do it, how they find people. And we have a great conversation about just creating music for yourself, kind of discovering your own voice. Let me just get into it. Here's the interview starting right now. My name is Amy Waters, and I'm a musician, composer, and YouTuber. Yeah. And how long have you been making music? Like, I know, I want to say your first album came out in 2011, maybe? Um, under which name? I think I <laughs> right. put my very first album together proper in 2008 was okay. the very first album I ever made. And that was under the name, The Lonely Doodle. Um, the Lonely it's, Doodle? It's, the Lonely Doodle. Yes. You, can't, <laughs> you, you need to know me to have that album. It's not on any streaming services or anything. Okay. All right. Um, it was a, it's, it was a, it was a duo that I did with my, like one of my best friends still to this day. Um, and it's like. 75% of it's like very obviously borrowed from Ben Folds five. And then about 30% oh. of it is like, I don't even know, like acoustic nineties rock, I guess. I don't know. It's <laughs> very different from anything I do these days. And it was, I feel like the first album, and I think you're referencing was the first motive makes a man album. Yes. That was me saying, I'm going to stop trying to make x sound like i was trying really hard to make piano rock was what i wanted to make okay and before that i was trying to do this sound or that sound and with that album i was like i'm not going to try to make a sound i just want to i just want to let go and see what happens and i came up with this like kind of folky like folk punk kind of sound that uh slowly incorporated synths and then i started doing other things and kind of now i'm where i am but yeah that was i've been doing music i've been recording music since i um since I went to college, I think was when I started. So that was 2005. Okay. Did you um, go to college for music or no? I did. I went to college for music performance. Um, I went for saxophone performance initially. Really? And got very, very burnt out because I hated my saxophone professor. Oh. Um, and, uh, and then shifted to uh, music composition. Uh-huh. And then I left that school, moved home, got married, went to another school for music business, dropped out of that school, went to another school for small business management, uh, dropped out of that program, went to another school for philosophy and small business. I've been to like seven different schools and (laughs) don't have a degree. Um, But yes, I did originally go to college for music and had a, like one of my, one of my very good friends from college and one of the few people who I still talk to from that era of my life. Um, Because just just as a like footnote to that, I went to school for music performance at a Bible college. So it oh, was really, yeah, yeah. It was a, a North Central University. It's in Minneapolis. It's a Assembly of God Bible College, and um, I didn't know there was a music college or a, 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 I, I don't even know how to say, Bible music college. Huh. Yeah, okay. it's, it's actually it actually has a surprisingly competent uh, music program. Okay. Most people who go there go to like learn how to do like worship leading, like worship music. Okay. Um, and a lot of the music department pushes that um but th- we had a we had a jazz band and like the theory teacher was maybe one of the smartest people on campus like he is still to this day one of the most incredibly uh informed and intelligent people i've ever met in terms of like just knowing about music theory yeah um he pushed me really hard in my final music theory class and getting a i think i got a either a b minus or a c plus in that class and it's the proudest grade i've ever gotten Um, as as a like as like a straight a high school student i was like i worked for that b minus all right Um, all right um but yeah but so because of that you know i've I've changed a lot in my life a lot of we've i've changed a lot since we last talked Mm -hmm. um and uh, a lot of people who go to a conservative bible college might not want to still be friends with me um so (laughs) 
uh, I have a few friends though who I've stayed really close with. And um, one of them was really into audio engineering. He was going to school for recording and engineering and he got me into it. And I started with a eighth inch to quarter inch like cable that I plugged into the microphone okay. input on my mother, or, like on my motherboard on my computer. Yeah. That was my original DAW. And I just recorded straight with that. And then eventually I got like a small little like two in, two out box. And I recorded a bunch of stuff with that. And then just basically self-taught myself everything over the years. Like the programs and everything that you record on multi-tracking. What did you yeah. start out with multi-tracking? I want to see if it's the same one that everybody tells me. <laughs> mm. Oh my gosh. What's the name of it? I actually have to, I need to click to my old files in my music folder. Cause I have the name of it in there. I don't actually remember the name of my first DAW. Um, where are those photos recording? Uh, traction was my very first. Really? Song. Okay. I'm surprised by that. Everybody else always tells me cake. <laughs> yeah. Nope. I, I mean, I had lots of friends who used cakewalk. Um, my, oh yeah. My cakewalk. Dad, I said cake. Like it's the okay, band it's with the short. trumpet. <laughs> it's, it's, it's short for cakewalk. It's fine. Okay. All right. <laughs> I figured, I figured you were using like inside lingo. Like that's what everyone calls it. Like, <laughs> no, just ignorance. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, uh, I, my dad, used cakewalk when I was a kid, like when we first got a computer in our that's house. That's what I mean. Every, uh, everybody, yep. it, cause it's the free version. Yeah. That's yeah. the tractor. My, yeah. That's tra yeah. Traction. Um, I traction. use traction. I'm sorry. I use uh, traction and reason were the two I started with. Okay. Uh, reason yeah. back then didn't have any, uh, 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 inputs. You had to work within the ecosystem and it was very like electronic oh. music focused, which was my first like dabble with like synths and electronic music. Um, and then I used traction because my friend who was really into audio engineering was the kind of person who tries every single DAW on the market and then picks the one he thinks is the most intuitive. Yeah. And so I was always looking to him for what I should, what I should use. And he also introduced me to Reaper, uh, my sophomore year. And I've been using that ever since Reaper is my, my normal DAW of choice. Okay. All right. And then, so you would, you would go to school, you, you, uh, started recording music. You found, you found the, uh, sound you wanted. Now, when you said you let go and just finally started doing it, like, were you, this was just, you turned on record and this is what came out. Like how, how did it change from trying to be, which I still find very surprising a reference to Ben folds five and trying to be that, like, you don't hear that very often, but, but how did it come to be that like you, you said you let go and started playing this way? Like, how did that come about? Yeah. Um, I think it actually started in a in in the lyric writing. I had a journal that I would bring with me everywhere, and I just jot down ideas for lyrics. And when I'd sit down to try to put those lyrics to song, which is typically at that time how I wrote music, mm -hmm. um, um, I I kind of let go of some of the. It wasn't necessarily rules I had, but like when I would sit down to write a song, I'd sit down at a piano and mm -hmm. I would play stuff that I was like oh, I want this to sound like this kind of song, or maybe this is more of like a okay. quieter yeah. song. And and I thought at the time when I was doing these things that I was just writing my own music, but like I look back on some of these songs now and I'm like, like this is just me trying to do ARMY. That's what this is. Like <laughs> I have one song that I listen to and it's like, this is uh, Constantine by something corporate. That's what I'm doing. I'm literally making my version. It's 10 minutes long. It's a long, sad, like, like love song. That's what this is. Um, and I wanted to try and at the time, not, I was, I was thinking in my head, just like, I don't want to do what I do with Lonely Doodle. I want to do something else. Mm -hmm. And so I think the first thing was that I picked up a guitar instead of a, a piano. Mm. And then as I started to play around on the, the guitar, I was getting like ideas about songs that I wanted to write where I was like letting go of like, what should the song be about? Well, it could be about anything. And so I started to get really into telling stories through music. Um, I was like, I wrote um, a song that was all about like, uh, uh, the idea behind it was like, what would it be like to live in a time where you're the first person to uh, explore like, like the Northern ice seas as a, as like in a ship and you're like a part of the crew and you're the first ones to get to go to the Arctic. Um, and so I kind of wrote a story from that perspective and then it eventually evolved into a like existential nightmare song about um, the dreams of a dead crew at the bottom of the ocean that never made it to their destination. Wow. Um, got dark. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the stuff on that album actually, because I feel like I let it be what it needed to be. It, it, some of it got dark. There's another, there's two boat songs actually. The other one is 
is all about the idea of like a pirate crew that found the fountain of youth and now they are living on the earth hundreds of thousands of years in the future because they can't die the earth is poisoned like the seas are dead no one else is alive and they are stuck sailing this endless dead sea uh with no hope of ever escaping and how in that situation the last like all they would want is for like to be able to let go um, wow, I so, feel like we should be sitting around a campfire right now while you're telling me these. <laughs> yeah, I was listening to a lot of folk at the time, so I was like listening to like uh, like uh, um, Gordon Lightfoot and okay. like um, like like the like the classic songwriters who told big stories with their music, and uh, and I think that's a big part of what inspired me. And then I was also listening to a lot of like um, AJJ and like um, uh, Harley Poe and like a lot of like the folk punk scene. Okay. Um, and so I think that also started to come out. I, I let go of being like being careful too. Like there was a big movement away from like, like I had for the longest time tried to like maybe shift my voice or conform my voice to like a more like, like palatable sound. And with this stuff, I was like, no, I'm going to sing exactly how I sing when I'm, when no one's listening. And so it was much more nasally and much more like, like, I'm not trying to sound like someone else. I'm just going to sound however I sound. And it ended up, you know, I think that was also really inspired by like, I was listening to a lot of me without you and a lot of people who like a lot of like people who like, there was like some incorporation of like free form, like poetry, like, like slam poetry worked into it too. Hmm. And that was the rule. Like, it's like, whatever happens, happens. And so like that first album kind of had a, a tone, but then everything I did after that was like, I'm just going to let the music dictate where we're going. And that came out a lot in the arranging, um, like when I was putting the songs together. And, uh, and I think that that lesson I learned was really crucial for like future stuff. Cause it was like, you don't have to do this sound or that sound. You just make whatever, yeah. Whatever the arrangement needs is what it what it will be, I guess. Okay. And when did you start actually making videos for it? Like that's the other thing that's a really mm-hmm. big part of your music. And and yeah. how did how did that come about? When did you go? When did you get the idea? Or I mean, I suppose as a musician, you always get the idea. But really, just kind of what was the first foray into making the videos? I guess. Um. I guess the first foray into video in general was it was a hobby from my childhood. Um, okay. I was, uh, have you ever seen the show home movies? Yes. Yeah. I love that so, show. So that was my childhood was like me and my friends with a crappy video camera making okay. terrible movies. Anytime I'd have friends over or we'd have a sleepover, the camera would be there and we'd be dreaming up what we're going to do and what stupid sketches we were going to come up with. I have, a giant box of old mini DV tapes right over there that I've been slowly um, capturing oh, and, really? and digitizing and reliving some of these ridiculous like moments in my childhood. Um, it's really fun. Like kind of an aside to that just quickly is that like, I think a lot about how the generation before me doesn't have a lot of, especially like my parents per se, like don't have a lot of hard record of their dumbest years um <laughs> and the generation after me my kid can potentially have a forever record oh yeah on social media like i see people who you know like they said something really stupid when they were 14 or 15 and now they're in their 20s and people are trying to call them out for it and i'm like guys if you saw the stuff that was on these tapes that i was saying when i was 14 <laughs> or 15 like you don't understand like the late 90s were a different time <laughs> <laughs> but uh but I have this unique thing where I have a record of how stupid I was and it's mine and it's private and I can watch it mm-hmm. and I can reflect and I can empathize with like current people who are 14, 15 and 16. Um, and, and I feel like it grounds me a little bit, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, I hope that it can be one of those tools that like, you know, there's that like point where you realize, Oh my God, I'm my parents. Um, and I have those moments with my, with my 11 year old, uh, more often than I want to admit, <laughs> right? but it's nice to have this thing that goes, Oh yeah, I used to be a dumb, goofy kid as well. Like I, I get it. I, I feel like it helps. And I like that it, but I like that it's private. I like that it's in a box over there and I can share the parts that I feel comfortable sharing and then not share the other parts. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. But anyways, back to, that was how I started with video and, okay. and I loved making silly videos and I always wanted to like, every chance I could 
and could afford to like get a better camera was really, really important to me because specifically because of the limitations of like when, as I grew older, when my friends and I could get together, it was typically late at night and we were typically out in our like town square of our little like country Illinois town, which is another very short sidebar. Um, The town that Groundhog Day took place in. Oh, um, by Woodstock. Yeah, Woodstock. I spent like most of my childhood in Woodstock and then moved to McHenry uh, as an adult. That was where my first house was in McHenry. Okay. Um, And so, uh, yeah. And uh, but we'd hang out on the town square at like two in the morning. And um, I wanted a camera that could film at night. Like that was the most important thing to me was that we could actually do stuff. And so when my love for this is like. I always say that like what I do now is kind of a confluence of all of my hobbies and passions because I got into better video because I bought a better film, uh, a better photography camera. Hmm. Like I was really into photography as well at the time I had a Nikon D 80 and I wanted to go to full frame. So I saved up for like a whole year, sold some of my old music equipment that I didn't use anymore and bought a 5d Mark II okay. uh, Canon and that had video and I could take it and film at night and it didn't look like garbage. And I was like, this is so cool. And so I had this 5D Mark II um, that I had had since uh, 2010, I think was when I got it. And when we moved to Portland and I was trying to figure out my music career, um, you know, I tried a bunch of different things. A lot of them didn't work. And one of the things was like, well, I have this nice camera. I like shooting video. I could film. I love these cover artists on YouTube, like Pom- like like Pomplamoose, who are like making these fun video covers of songs. Yeah, and I'm checking out like people like Smooth McGroove who are doing video game music. Like, oh, okay, maybe I can do something like this. And so I just kind of was like, I have the camera. I like doing film. Let's put the two together and see what happens. And and like a lot of my earliest stuff on YouTube is is has been kind of it's the only part of my YouTube channel where I've kind of started to private some of the videos oh really um, specifically because i did i did a lot of different things back then i had some where it was like looping videos somewhere i did um just like piano covers and i did this whole series where i was playing like my acoustic guitar on my front porch and i i i hid those primarily because i realized my address is in like full display oh, no. in the videos <laughs> and well if someone wanted to track me down they probably could um making it a little bit harder feels like the right thing to yeah. do. Yeah, so, uh, so like, but it was also like, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And all I knew is that I wanted to do music. Like that's, that was it. I wanted to be, I wanted to take this thing that I had poured like many years and many hours into doing as a hobby and a passion. And I wanted to, that to be the thing I did to make money. And so, um, YouTube just happened to be the thing that worked. It clicked. I built a good enough audience. That audience kept growing. I loved doing it. And it's just continued to go from there. So that's kind of how it kind of just came together. Because I, I, like I said, I, I liked photography. And then that led to getting a good camera that had video. And yeah. that led yeah. to doing video. And and now, now I feel like I have to do work to separate parts of my passion from the thing that I monetize to make money. Like uh, I, I early last year, almost a year ago now, I decided to get into trying film photography. Yeah. You've got a and book that you just here. released with squirrels. I, I do have a book and though the book is actually mostly digital pictures. Um, uh, but uh, I, the book came together because I started walking around my neighborhood and taking pictures. Uh-huh. And one of the things is like, at the same time, I'm watching all these YouTubers who make YouTube videos about film photography and like, we'll go out on shoots and take pictures. And a p- big part of my brain's like, Hey, you could do this. You could make film videos. And I was like, no, like photography is going to be passion. Not, it's not going to be a part of this, of this multimedia social online landscape that like, everything I do, I need to put online and monetize. Mm -hmm. Like this is going to be my thing. And I put the squirrel book together less as a way to make money, but more as a way to fund a project. And so that's like, I like, I made enough money to make the books I need to make. Okay. Um, Okay. And I, then, so like, that's about as far as I want to go with photography right now. I don't want it to be my job because my other big passion of music And my other big passion of making video and my other like fun hobby of like messing around in Photoshop. Um, 
all of those are now my job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, I use Photoshop to make the thumbnails. I use video and video editing to put the videos together. I spend a lot of time making music and I love it all, but it does have a different, it has a different feel when it's your job. Like it just, you're, you're thinking all the time about what is a way to monetize this, or should I be putting this on the internet or should I be sharing this process or, and I like having something where I'm not thinking about that at all. I'm just like, I'm going out for a walk and I'm going to put, you know, this film in my camera because it's what I want to shoot. And that's all that matters. Like yeah. nothing else matters. So huh. anyways, that's, that's kind of an aside about, about, but I, I think it, well, it connects. Cause it's like, it's just about like when I feel like some people don't, I've seen too many of my friends who fall into the dangerous pitfall of, um, I have turned my passion into my job and now, and especially as a social media person or as a YouTuber or God forbid, if you call yourself an influencer, um, <laughs> you get in this bad headspace where everything could be monetized. And then you start judging yourself. If you don't put it on the internet or you don't like slap a donation link on it, or you don't, you know, put the behind the scenes video behind a paywall. And it's just like, I want to do those things because I'm passionate about doing them. I don't want to feel bad if I don't do them. And I don't want that to take over my life. Like I don't want to be thinking about filming a vlog when I'm out for a walk with my family. Like that's just yeah. not how I want to live. And so I kind of put up boundaries and I think that's a really important thing in the current landscape of being like a creator on the internet. Yeah. And now I feel weird for my next question, which is going to be, oh. how did you start finding people? <laughs> which I mean is, and I get what you're saying. It's just funny to transition into that, that question uh, of, of going about like you started posting on YouTube and um, I mean, I post on YouTube. I don't have, you, you have way more followers than I do. I mean, you know, it, yeah. so it's not just uh, post on YouTube, get fans, Oh no, you know, no, no, no. It, like that, like that South Park episode where it's like, get underpants, question mark, rule the world, you know? It's, yeah. <laughs> yes. It's not, unfortunately, I think, um, oh man, how did I find people? That is a, um, I, I think when you say people, you're talking mostly about like audience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and not even necessarily to monetize it's, it's, uh, I mean, making things and putting them out there. And a lot of people say, be consistent. And it's like, well, that still doesn't mean that people are going to magically find what you do, you know? And, yeah. And so how did people start discovering you? I guess maybe that's what I really mean. How did, how did, no. or did yeah, you find them? Yeah, that's a great, it's a really good question. And I think it's one that a lot of people who find success oversimplify or say the way that, that it worked for them and think that that will work for everyone. Mm -hmm. And what yeah. I find is anytime I hear someone answer this question, they, leave one huge thing out of the equation and that's luck. Yeah. Like luck plays. I am lucky to be doing what I'm doing still and to have the following I have. Um, because when I found a quirky indie game, uh, that was riffing off of one of my favorite classic RPGs, earthbound. Uh, okay. and I was like, okay, this quirky earthbound esque indie game. And I played it and it emotionally affected me. And then I did my first cover from it. And I happened to have a friend who was also doing covers from that game. And then we both reached out to the creator of that game and said, Hey, would it be cool if we put like together a little like EP of our covers? And he reached out back to us and said, I would like to be involved. Let's make it official. And that naturally spiraled into a double album of undertale covers, oh, which right. was the game. And then that literally blew up like that. That's the most successful thing I've ever made. And we just happened to be right at the front of a huge wave. Mm -hmm. um, and it was luck. It was all luck. It's lightning in a bottle. There's there's no way I could possibly give advice on how to make that happen again. Like, right. Because right. I did Undertale covers because I loved this tiny game. And then that tiny game ended up being extremely, extremely popular and had a really passionate fan base. And like since then I've seen countless musicians try to find the next undertale. And I'm like, guys, <laughs> it'll come when it comes. And like, you just, if you're lucky enough to be at the front of the wave, then it happens. And, yeah, and that's all yeah. that it can be. And like, you know, I have friends who have gotten like 
voted up to the front page of Reddit, and that's that's luck. Like you get that because you're lucky. That's the only like the algorithms rolled in your favor, and now now you have a flood of people who are seeing what you do. Um, consistency helps, obviously. I think that's a common answer. Is I did weekly videos for almost five years without taking a break. Mm. Um, that helped a lot. Um, but right before I released Determination, which was the Undertale cover album, I was at a point where I was like, I've got about three months before I give up Hmm. Um, because I'm not monetized well enough. This isn't paying my bills. I need to go get a better job. Um, A year before that, I basically gave myself a year um, because the year before that came out, uh, the job I was currently doing uh, was like, hey, we need you to buy new equipment to keep doing this job. And that new equipment would cost me like five or six hundred dollars and it was a independent contractor job that when i really totaled out how much money i was making for the amount of hours i was working it's about two dollars an hour oh, no. <laughs> so it was good because i could set my own schedule and it was relatively simple but it was just and you could really grind and make decent money but you had to grind mm-hmm. and you just tack onto that this huge like bill for like new equipment that they weren't willing to um, pay for. And I was like, I need to, I need to stop working this job. And I, you know, we had some savings. So I talked to my partner and I was like, Hey, what if I, what if I take a year and I just try to make music my full-time career Mm -hmm. and I've been trying to do it like part-time, but let's try it. Let's just make music the thing I do. And I was reaching the end of that year. I was like, okay, I tried. (laughs) Like I put out a video every week. I'm not very good at, I always feel like I'm not very good at marketing and promotion. I, I consistently feel like okay. I, if I had a, if I had a, a, like a manager I could trust, I would be in a better position, but I don't actually know if that's true because it's luck plays such a huge role in it. And like, you're doing this all yourself. You said you don't have a manager, like you literally have, have nobody doing anything else for you. Currently. I, I mean, outside of like, like obviously my fan base word of mouth sharing stuff is, is helpful. Um, but no, I don't have anyone that like, I, I, from, from start to end, make my videos. I edit the videos. I build the thumbnails. I yeah. uh, promote. I don't have a manager. I don't have a like an agent or anything like that. Um, well, how much of the music marketing classes that you took influence what you do or uh, actually help? What, like, do you use any of that? Because that, that was also probably before the time of a lot of the things that we have now. Like, did any yeah. of that kind of translate at all? Um. I feel like the stuff that translated more affects my like imposter syndrome or like makes me go like, you're not doing the right things. You know, the right things to do and you're not doing them okay. because they just are not, they are so counterintuitive to my personality. Like I am very much a person who's like, I want to make a thing and put it out there. And if you connect with it, awesome. Yeah. But like, I do not want to shove it down your throat. I do not want to demand. I can't that part's demand tough. you listen I to agree. my music. Yeah. And I have friends who are like really good at that. And they're like, hey, this thing is this thing is awesome. Go listen to it. It's so good. And I'm like, how do you do that without wanting to die? Like, yeah. <laughs> like or or like, even like not to, like I have uh, I know people, musicians who they put out stuff and I'm just like, what they're saying sounds like they're just talking to one of their friends. When I do it, it sounds like I'm going, hello, this is bleep blorp bloop and please go download booba sincerely me. You know, that's what my, I feel yeah. like my stuff sounds like when I put it out. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I definitely struggle with that. Um, uh, but I, I think like to, to like kind of, I, I feel like saying like luck is the only thing, like is the biggest thing is like a little, um, can be a little depressing. Um, but uh, I also think that like, you know, one thing I noticed was um, early on, I made a conscious decision that I was going to make the, 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 the top rule is make stuff I'm passionate about. Yeah. And if I'm not passionate about it, I'm not going to do it. Okay. And so there's, there is a authenticity in that, that I think is communicated uh, through my work. And authenticity is another really important block of doing stuff on the internet the internet, like everyone, like, I feel like it's such an important thing. Like authenticity is very, very, very important to this current era of consumers of creator content. Mm -hmm. Um, I see that's, that's where my marketing background comes in. I can use the right words. I know how to, (laughs) (laughs) Um, um, but, uh, uh, you know, like, like, for example, there's a, there's this big TikTok thing of this guy who like put up a, like a, 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 a picture it was like a big like cutout of himself for like it was like in a gas station it was like 
try the blah 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 meal. I don't know if you heard this story or no. not. Um, gosh, I wish I could remember his name. It was a really big deal. Basically, the TikTok is like, uh, I I learned that like he's like, listen, I'm gonna make this huge cutout of myself. I'm gonna put it in a in a in a in a like a, a come and go or something like one of the gas stations. Okay. And and then I'm just gonna tell them that this is from from headquarters. Like this is from marketing. We'll see how long it lasts. And so it seemed like a really funny like prank. And then like people started going to it and laughing about it, and it was getting a lot of groundswell. And people were like, this is so cool. And then it came out that he was in contact with the gas station from the beginning and the whole thing was faked and the backlash of like, Oh you, no, you told us you were authentic and you lied, like was so strong. And it's like, you cannot fake this. Like if you try to fake this and you are found out, um, Oh, like lonely girl, never... lonely girl 15. Do you remember that? Yep. yep. Oh, yeah. Same sort yep. of thing. Yeah. Yep. Or like, and like there is, there is a, a, a line because there are obviously like, fictional podcasts that pretend like they're not fictional but they tell you if you go to their website you know like this is fiction like yeah um was it the there's there's a couple like horror ones that i got really into for a while that were like mystery stories that sound like they're just a normal podcast but then things start going really weird and it's like oh okay i see what you're doing (laughs) um which is very much in like the like uh welcome to night fail kind of territory where it's like oh okay this is getting weirder and weirder um but i think it's more like I've never heard more people talk about industry plants than in the last couple of years on TikTok yeah. of like artists who show up and they're like trying to be punk and like, and then everyone's like, who are these people? And they start doing research and they're like, you are all connected to huge music industry people. You're a plant. Like mm-hmm. this isn't real. This isn't authentic. Yeah. And like people want authenticity. So I made a really, I made that decision not because I thought authenticity is a marketable trait. I made that decision because I would kill my love for music and my relationship with music if I wasn't authentic. Valid. And and to the point that I make decisions that are not the most marketedly good decisions. Like just a couple months ago, I covered a song from the new uh, Wes Anderson film. And oh, like, okay. That's not going to get very many views. I know it. I've covered several Wes Anderson songs in the past. They are some of my lowest performing videos. But I went and saw uh, The French Dispatch and one of the songs like, like as I was listening to it, I'm like, I need to cover the song. This yeah. is going to get covered. And it did. And then I went and did it. And and because of that, I have fostered a fan base that, while smaller, like I have had some friends who, you know, they they tent pull, they chase the trends, they do the big thing. Mm-hmm. They are much more successful than I am. Um, we st- like there's quite a few people who we kind of all started at the same time and and like I'm I'm kind of at this i've been basically slow grinding my way to oblivion is the way i word it like <laughs> my growth has been slow the entire time where i've had quite a few friends who've really blown up and like they're happy with doing what they do like I, i'm not in any way saying they're inauthentic but All like right. like that's works for them and for me i just couldn't do that and you know and also like the style of music i do is more niche than like you know like one of like my friend rich who we did determination together he does power metal covers like Mm -hmm. that that hits all the target demos of youtube like it's perfect right um and he doesn't do it because it's perfect he does it because he likes power metal like um but it's and that's the thing that i think is really great is when you can find something you love that you can also that also works in a marketing sense that's like the the magic yeah um i've had a couple of those where i'm like oh this uh i did it i did a cover of the like of a like early '90s Sizzlers com- Sizzler commercial. Did you really? I didn't yeah, see that like, one. Uh, like Sizzler was it? Sizzler is like the choice of America, like all across oh, the yeah. USA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I used to know the whole song, and I brought on like twenty different people for this cover. I had people from all over YouTube add their like add their voice to the song. I had sax solos and guitar solos and mm-hmm. spoken word bits and and when I thought of the idea, I was like, I saw the video and went, I need to cover this. And then I went, this would be a perfect 4th of July cover. And so that's, <laughs> that was where I had a passion. And then I was able to attach it to like a marketable space and then yeah. was able to do something really cool with it. So that 
like I, I can never turn that part of my brain off. Obviously, it's there. Right. But the first rule is, and it's what also fun to me. discover a thing like that, like going like that would be really fun or funny. Like that also is kind of like doing something like a Sizzlers commercial, which is yeah. funny because I recently have been totally into watching like old VHS tapes of like uh, fast food training videos. So that's like half the suggestions for me on YouTube right now when I pull yeah. it up. <laughs> yeah, but, and uh, yeah, and like. Um, and like a, another f- a fun one of those was uh, I was watching, um, I believe it was Summer Games Done Quick, or maybe it was Awesome Games Done Quick. One of the two, which is, you know, the big speed running um, uh, events that happen on Twitch where they raise a bunch of money for uh, either the Prevent Cancer Foundation or I think it's Doctors Without Borders in the summer. Okay. And in, in Awesome Games Done, it was I think it was Awesome Games Done Quick because they always do a block that's called the awful block where they're purposely awful video games that they speed run. Nice. Like really weird, obscure games. And they were playing this game, I think it was called Urban Yeti, which was like a Game Boy Advance game. And the soundtrack for it was absurdly bad. Really? And they kept calling it, uh, what did they call it? Like something trombone, um, trombone disaster. That's what they called it. <laughs> and I was like, wouldn't it be funny if I tried to cover this song? Yeah. And so I put it on the internet, like, wouldn't it be funny if I covered trombone disaster, hashtag AGDQ? And one of the artists who does a lot of the art for AGDQ reached out to me and was like, if you do this, I will make animations and art for you and we could do it together. Wow. So we ended up doing this really cool like cross art collab where where like I had all these like animations that popped up in my video throughout it and stuff that were connected to the game. And it was one of the most fun projects I've ever done. Um and that was something that, like, I had no idea. I'm like, will this mean anything to anyone? Yeah. And and I mean, it 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 the, the video didn't do poorly. Like, right. it was really fun. And so, like, I've learned over the years that like sometimes a passionate idea won't work at all. Sometimes it will go very very well because yeah. you will find that niche group of fans who are like, oh my god, someone else likes the thing I like. And so, yeah, cool. in terms of a business decision there are benefits to it. And I think the biggest benefit, and I was kind of getting to this before, and that's why I, I'm coming back to it to kind of finish off this question, which is the biggest benefit of choosing intentionally to do this is that I have a fan base um, and like a support system of fans who are here because they want to hear what I am passionate about. They want to hear the next thing that I want to do. They're not here because they want more undertale music they're not here because they want to hear like this thing right i i do things where like they will request songs and stuff and that's awesome but like ultimately anytime i say like hey guys i need to take a break or i need to do this or i need to do that they're like take your time we're here because we support you and we want to hear what you do when you're at your best Mm -hmm. you know quality over quantity all the time uh and i just have the most supportive fan base like absolutely i'm so grateful for uh for the you know, it's one of those, like, <clears throat> I can look at my numbers all day and get depressed, but, like, I have such a quality, like, and strong fan base who stick by me that, like, that's so much more important than numbers. Like, I'd rather be a 20K YouTuber where 90% or 70% of my views are coming from non-subscribers, so that subscriber number doesn't even mean anything anymore. Yeah. And have a Patreon where, like, 60 people come together because they care about what I'm doing and are willing to put money down to make sure that I can keep doing what I'm doing. And there are like, take a break if you need to take a break. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the ultimate, the ultimate statement of the value of this was when, when I took a three month break, which was about two months after we last talked, Mm -hmm. Um, I went back and saw when we last talked, I took, I took two or three months off. And in that two or three months, I had a complete identity crisis and went through a very, very difficult part of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, And when I came out of it on the other side, I had big announcements I needed to make about who I was. And I've seen a lot of people when they come out as trans um, lose a big chunk of their fan base. Mm -hmm. And I didn't lose a single supporter on Patreon when I did that. Like I had some people who stopped following me on YouTube. I got a couple nasty comments and, just kind of slid off my back, but like the community I fostered intentionally, the people in my discord, the people who either support me, like by like showing up to like, like a fan space, like a discord or go the extra step in actually supporting me monetarily. 
um, didn't lose a single person in those spaces. Like, because the community I had fostered was there for me and me being more of myself was okay. Like, cool. You understand yourself better. That's awesome. We're here for you. Yeah. And so like that moment was like, all right, I might have struggled. I may struggle more. I might not ever be like huge, which has its own. There are definitely some things that I feel like I could talk about in that, like this, 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 the harder parts of that. Yeah. Um, but I have a community that's stuck by me and that's, that's everything. I like, can, that's absolutely everything. I mean, that's how I found out about you to begin with was I was talking to someone who, uh, listened to my band and they said, you should talk to this person. I, I love their music and what they do. <laughs> you know, it's, and, yeah. and that's how I found out about you to begin with. So I, I can totally agree with you on your fan base and I, I, a little bit jealous. I'll tell you that it's, it's, it's nice. I think it's fantastic. And I've been following you ever since and just love what you've been doing. And I've, I actually have one more question I want to ask you about, yeah. which is you're talking about collaborating, collaborating with the other people. Um, how do you do that? How do you <laughs> collaborating with people online is not the simplest task and uh, like sharing DAW files and all that kind of stuff. Like, are you doing it that way? Or are you just sending them a file? They record it, give you the stems. Like what's the process, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, at different projects, we have done things differently. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of the most common thing we do is I put together like a draft or a work in progress file. That's typically. Um, so yeah, I guess for me, um, the most important thing for me when I collaborate with people is that it is actually a collaboration and not a, because I think there's like two ways you can collaborate. Um, okay. and, and I don't disparage people who do the other, the other way, which, uh, I'll describe now the, the one way is that I have a part in my arrangement that I've already written out that I think should be a trombone. Okay. I do not have the skill set to play trombone. So I'm going to reach out to my trombone player friend and ask if they could play this part. I send them the music or the MIDI file. They play along to it. They send it back to me. Um, that is that is not the kind of collaborations I'm super interested in, but I understand the value of that, especially if you're doing really complex arrangements. Um, you know, it's kind of like, like I could not imagine writing Frank Zappa music unless you have the entire thing <laughs> in your head mapped out to a T. Yeah. And like that has a place. It has a purpose. I totally get that. But for me, when I collaborate on the internet, I want it to be as close to us sitting in a room and jamming together as possible. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do is I send a bare bones uh like work in progress file that will typically be like like a drum machine, a bass part, and then maybe like one or two other things that really establish the flow is the most important thing. Like here's section A, here's section B. You can kind of hear it's going to get quieter here. It's going to get louder here. Then I send a big document with all of my ideas, like for like vibes, basically. Like okay. this is how I, I want this section to sound like the, like I remember in one, I was like, okay, so we're going to start off like kind of quiet and then it's going to build up and it's going to like rock out for like two, for like a verse and a chorus. And then when it comes to the bridge, I want it to sound like, I want it to sound like the bridge from uh, La Villa Strangato from Rush. And I want it to be like, like really moody and atmospheric. And then that's going to explode into this other section. And yeah. that's how I describe it. And then I say, and like, I want you to do a lead here and maybe like a rhythm here, but honestly do what you want, like do what moves you. Okay. Cause I want I want my collaborations to not be my song that I got a feature on. I want it to be our song. Like I want the song to come out of our back and forth. And so uh, doing the, doing the work in progress means I get to finish what I get. They have lots of space to fill in. They have like, they, there's tons of space for them to play in. Yeah. And then when I get those parts, I get to listen to them, see how they changed what I did and adapt to it and add new things and polish it off and do the final mix and that's what I love about working with others. So um, I tend to not share uh, actual DAW files. I tend to just be like, do a mix down, send it out, okay. tell them to click. Like this is this is the the click. If they're not working in Reaper, most of my friends use Reaper, which is great. Yeah. Because I can be like, throw this at the beginning of your project file, set the click to this amount, you're good. But sometimes clicks get slightly off if you're using other DAWs. So I'll be like, I'll just export a click file to, and I'll be like, here you go. Here's the click track. Or if it's something okay. that's shifting time signatures, because I do that sometimes too, I'll be like, I sent you the click, I sent you the, or I'll send you the tempo map. And then, and then they send me back stems and then I do the mixing in the end and mix in the stuff with the stems. 
So that is that is tends to be how the vast majority of my my covers work. I did a big collaboration very recently with four different musicians. Yeah, I saw that. That one I put together a full folder with with the Reaper file, oh, all okay. of the plugins, everything they needed, and said be, and the big thing was that it was long and it had a long tempo map and it had I had tons of markers that marked in the project where each section was. Mm -hmm. So if they had the, the 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 Reaper file, they could see. I want you to come in at marker fifteen. Oh, there's marker fifteen. Like that made it a lot easier oh. for to bring four different people together who are coming in at different times and doing different things. Um, but one of the people who worked on that doesn't use Reaper, so that was almost no help to them. So I, also <laughs> did a, I also did a mix down because they're they're a loser who uses Pro Tools and, <laughs> and has to use the industry standard. And <laughs> right. No, I, I yeah. liked that. I liked that. Uh, that prog uh, That's actually why I was asking about it. Cause I'm like, Oh yeah, there are like four or five different people working on this song or possibly more, you know, and I was really curious how you did that. And so when you're sharing the files, how, how are you sharing them? Like, are you just using a Dropbox? Do you have like, okay, you are just using Dropbox. Just using right? Dropbox or, or Google files, depending like I just send them over. On, I, I use Dropbox cause I paid for it and right. And I'm stuck in it now. Like right. I'm basically, I don't really think it's the best. Um, and then they'll send me files back with whatever file sharing site they use. Um, we don't use. I don't currently use any kind of like. I have a friend who really, really, really wants me to get into. I think it's called Splice. It's like an online collaborative tool between I tried it. that. Yeah, it's all right. It's and <laughs> I, and he's tried to get me to use it. It's the same friend actually who got me into recording in the first place. Oh. The guy who seeks out like the cool new stuff. He's tried to get me to use that. We played with Endless for a while, which is like a collaborative looping program. Mm -hmm. Just a lot of fun to play with with friends. Like you're all just kind of affecting the song all together in right. different places. Doesn't necessarily the best thing for like actually taking that like fun jam and turning it into a full structured song. But mm -hmm. um, it was fun. It was a lot of fun to do that. I just, for me, it's easier to let each person work in their preferred workspace. Like I want, point. I want you to use what's comfortable for you. Like, I don't want to force you to use the things I use. And like, so like, it's like I don't use pro tools, but my friend who's been using it for 10 years, I'm not going to make him switch to, I tried to learn logic four years ago when I first got five years ago, six years ago, <laughs> I was when I first got a Mac. I was like, I'm going to try logic pro. Cause I hear it's fun. And I played with it for like three months and was like, it's just, it's not, it's nothing structurally about it that's wrong. It's just when I want to cut a file, I know how to do it in Reaper. When I want to right. copy, when yeah. I want to do this, I know where everything is. Am I learning or am I working? You know, like <laughs> Exactly. Uh, yeah. And like, it was the same problem with Ableton. I tried to learn Ableton and it was just like, for that one oh, though, it was, yeah, the workflow so different. Yeah. That one, it was, it was less of a, I just don't know where the functions are. It was more like this is an entirely different way of thinking about music. And it just, it's just not the way I think about music. And maybe someday I could think about it this way, but it's just not the way I put songs together. I want my friends to be able to, um, yeah, to be able to be comfortable in what, in use that makes the, a lot the, of sense the, the I, that they use. I could see the benefit um, of that for sure. I also, I also just wanted to say that, like, I think a big part of it, and this kind of is ties the last two questions together is that like a big part of what kept me going was finding like-minded creators like yeah. finding that side of the community like because when you when you ask like how did you find people uh, that's why i asked like are you talking about audience because equally as important was finding fellow musicians who do the thing that i do and a lot of that a, a lot of that came out of going to a convention mm -hmm. um i went to magfest in 2013 or 2014 um and i went not knowing almost anyone. And I had one friend on the internet who was a friend who I made because he reached out to me asking if he could put one of my songs on his like music podcast recommendation show he was doing at the time. Okay. And he was a creator who I like, I really respected. It's a, uh, it's, it's uh, Satchel Drake's is his name. He was, he's Satch bags, Satch bags goods for a long time. I don't know. If he still goes by that on, on YouTube or not anymore, but awesome dude um, makes in, incredible, incredible content and also like a really great friend. And he reached out to me. And at the time I was like losing my mind because it was like one of my favorite creators was talking to me. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. And I, very quickly I learned like, oh, we're all just people like, like there's no need to freak out. And we ended up becoming friends. And he said, go to the con, 
do it. Like, even if you know very few people, I promise you it'll be worth it. And through that convention, I managed to end up in a hotel with two other VGM creators who were people I had thought about working with and I thought about reaching out to, but I was too nervous to. And we spent hours sitting on sitting out on the balcony of MAGFest just talking about music and life. Nice. And we kind of dreamed up, like, could we do this again? And like one of those people was was Richardi B, and the other person was my friend Josiah, and we ended up making tons of music together over the years. And I met a bunch of people in the like video game YouTube world, and I met a bunch of people in the like in like all these different areas of YouTube. And I and I in navigating that, I you know I I was like, it's really important to think of those as like when I went to that convention, I, I one I learned no one knows what they're doing. Everyone is nervous. Everyone thinks that they're a fake and looks up to the person above them thinking, but they have it together. It was super, a super wild experience to like, I met um, uh, 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 George Weedman who creates the internet show Super Bunny Hop. Oh. And I looked up to him as like, you've got it all together. You're a, you're a real YouTuber. Yeah. And listening to him stand with me at a bar going like, oh my God, is that, is that, <laughs> I think that's John Tron. I'm going to go talk to him and ask him if he's seen my videos, but I'm so scared. I'm like, I felt like this two hours ago, hanging out with you. Right. What the hell? Like, and then we went over and then hearing John talk about meeting celebrities and feeling the exact same way. I'm like, no one knows what they're doing. No yeah. one, no one has this together. We're all, we're all on a ladder. We're all unable to see what, where we are on the ladder. Cause we're too busy looking up at the next rung. Like, and I let go of a lot of that anxiety. I'm like, we're all just people. There's mm. no reason to like hero worship. And I was like, and more importantly, I'm going to view going to cons as friendship building. Like yeah. I want to make relationships. I want to meet people who I want to be friends with. And I'm going to associate myself with people who, who, who connect with me. Um, and because of that, there were some creators who I met who I went, hmm, I'm getting red flags. I don't think <laughs> I'm going to hang out. And those only worked well for me. I'm just going to put it at that. Like some of the people who I got some of those warning signs from ended up having pretty big uh, controversies in the years to come. Okay. Um, and ended up, you know, saying some really uncomfortable things sometimes. So like, I was really grateful that like, like, you know, while I was at this convention, I was like, I just want to meet people. I just want to connect with people. I just want to be friendly. And you start to notice that, that that can turn very quickly into, I need to network. I need to make connections. I need to grow my business and my brand. Yeah. And those people stick out like a sore thumb in social gatherings and no one wants to be around them. Like mm -hmm. no one wants to be around the guy who's at the, at the party at MAGFest handing out business cards. Like, like it's not it's not good it's not a good vibe and like it, you feel it you're like oh that doesn't feel right like you're you you don't want to be friends with me you want an opportunity to like like you're seeing me you're seeing a money sign over my head or you're seeing a a subscriber count over my head and well, that just seems weird too it's like what you know think about it like in high school would you walk around going hi my name is and then hand them a business card like that's yeah. how do you introduce yourself that way <laughs> it's but, weird but it happens at cons yeah. very yeah. consistently and and I think the first time I met one of those people, like it was really strong in my head. I'm like, I never want to be that person. Yeah. I never want to be that person ever. So, and in a lot of ways, it's actually been a detriment because I have had legitimate friends who would be more than happy to work with me on a thing or, you know, signal boost something I've made, but I'm so nervous that it's going to come off as like opportunistic and it's going to harm our friendship mm. that I wait way too long to ask. And like, and it's, be, and it's always like, I've made friends with you you're a successful like million plus subscriber YouTuber. Yeah. I don't ever want to make you feel like I'm friends with you because of that number. Like I'm friends with you because, because we connected and I like hanging out with you and that's what matters. And I'm worried if I ask if you want to collab on a project that it's going to feel, it's going to break that. Hmm. And it's funny. It's kind of like the YouTube version of like, like I'm friends with you, but I kind of like you. And I'm worried if I ask if you want to go out on a date, it's going to ruin our friendship. It's that, but it's like, if I ask to collab, will you see me differently? Will it hurt our friendship? Will things never be the same? Oh yeah. Um, I could see that. Okay. Yeah. That makes total and, sense. And anytime I finally get up the courage and I ask, it's always super chill. And they're like, yeah, totally. Like, that's fine. That would be fun. And some of the wackiest videos I've ever put out on my channel came out of me just being like, 
we're friends. It's okay for me to talk to you about this. Like, yeah. so yeah. Anyways, value friends, connect with people. <laughs> it's really, really important. It keeps you in the, it, it'll keep you going. Like, cause when you feel like you're all alone, it's really, really hard. And if people yeah. wanted to check out your stuff, where do you suggest that they go? The easiest place to find me is my YouTube channel, which is uh, Amy Waters. It's just my name. Um, I've got socials and most of my socials are Amy Waters music. Um, if you look me up on Spotify, you will have to either look for me under my current name, which is Amy Waters, or you'll have to look for me under my old name, um, which is Ace Waters, uh, because uh, Spotify is really hard to change your name. And I decided when I changed my name that I would see my past as a part of the story that led me to who I am. So you can find me, you can find some of my stuff as Motive Makes a Man, you can find some of my stuff under my old name, and you can find some of the stuff under my current name. Um, and I would, my biggest thing, I guess, is if you're looking for stuff from me, like like YouTube is fun, fun covers and stuff. But over the last couple of years, I've poured an immense amount of effort into uh, two original albums, one of which is Cosmos of the Soul and the other which is Nakazora. They're thematically connected. They're very, very personal. They're connected to... Um, kind of the last few years of my life. And I would, it's one of those things where I think you kind of touched on this when I was talking about fan bases and like, how do you find people? Mm -hmm. And you said, mm -hmm. not necessarily about money, but just like finding people who want to listen to your music more than anything. I have come to realize that music is a, it's a back and forth. It is a, it's communication. And if there isn't someone on the other side of the communicating, I don't make music for myself. I think that's that's a nonsense thing that musicians say to themselves to feel like pure, but no, you don't. You make music to interact. You make music so that maybe you're communicating a message or a, an emotion or something. Yeah. It yeah. means just a pure artistic vision, but it's a back and forth. You need, you need an ear on the other side to take in what you're giving. And hmm. one of the hmm. hardest things for me is that like those two albums I poured so much into, and I it it is a little saddening that that so few people have heard them because anytime someone finds them, I tend to get very, very emotional and positive comments back. So uh, I encourage people to check out those two albums. Cosmos of the Soul is a synth wave, um, heavy, like dancey electronic album. Mm -hmm. And Not Aura is big mood ambient music. So it's a, it's a very somber atmospheric album. And you can find those on Spotify and on Bandcamp and, on Apple Music, uh, all the digital places you can find music. So great. That's a, even my even my picture. Where can we find you? Answer is long, but <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time and talking with me today. I was, I'm so glad yeah. we got the chance to do this. Thank you for having me. 